Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's MRS On Demand webinar, DNA Nanotechnology, a Foundation for Programmable Nanoscale Materials. Our host today is uh, Mark Bata of uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. My name is Bob Brockler. I'm the Virtual Engagement Manager at the Materials Research Society. As always, we're pleased to be teaming with the, uh, with the MRS Bulletin to bring you these monthly events. Our last webinar was Catalysts for Nanocarbon Growth, and that one's now archived and available at mrs.org slash webinars. So every webinar in the series is based on that month's MRS Bulletin theme topic, and we invite you, of course, to find out more about the MRS Bulletin at mrs.org slash bulletin. Right now you're looking at a list of some of the upcoming webinars in this series. The next webinar is Dealloyed Nanoporous Materials with Interface Controlled Behavior, hosted by Erica Lilioden of Helmholtz Zentrum Gestacht. We're going to get started in just a moment. But first, a couple of quick notes about the format of today's event and the uh, player that you're viewing it in right now. If you start over on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, you've probably already seen the chat room. Please feel free to use that throughout the event today. You can talk to your fellow attendees, uh, say hello, tell us where you're uh, viewing from. That's always uh, interesting to see. And then below that chat uh, interface, we have a questions tab. Uh, Following each one of our talks today, actually two of the three, we're going to have a, a short question and answer session with the, uh, with the speaker. And uh, we ask that you please use that questions tab to enter your questions. It really helps us keep track of the incoming questions if you use that tab rather than putting in the, them into the chat. But we will get any questions that come into the chat as well. Now, below the Questions tab, you'll see a tab marked Resources. In that tab, we have a complimentary copy of the intro article to the December MRS Bulletin and a link to the full issue as well as some other useful links and downloads. And then down at the lower left corner of the player, you'll find the Request Support button. If you have any uh, technical issues during today's event, uh, that will get you a, uh, uh, directly to a, a help desk, and they'll get your issue resol resolved for you. Now, just moving over to the right side of the player, you'll find a, a, a tab that says Notes. Click that tab, and it'll open up an interface where you can take notes during the presentation. Then those are going to be emailed to you along with the resources directly after the uh, webinar. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, editor of the MRS Bulletin, Dr. Gopal Rao. Thank you very much, Bob. And on behalf of MRS Bulletin, I welcome everyone to this webinar. So as Bob just mentioned, um, this webinar is based on the theme topic of the December issue of MRS Bulletin, uh, DNA Nanotechnology, a Foundation for Programmable Nanoscale Materials. There continues to be a greater convergence of biology and material science today. Uh, DNA nanotechnology can be viewed as a new materials design paradigm. Synthetic nucleic acids can be used to program the structure and dynamics of nanoscale devices and materials. And of course, DNA has extraordinary power to organize functional materials, as has been demonstrated in, in a number of recent studies. DNA nanotechnology is um, really spreading into diverse areas of traditional material science. The December issue of MRS Bulletin provides an overview of the unique capabilities of DNA nanotechnology, including techniques that make it accessible to researchers and also uh, a vision for its future applications. So the goal of the issue is really to promote the integration of DNA nanotechnology into material science. The three talks in this webinar um, nicely complement the articles in this issue. Now, the two guest editors of this MRS Bulletin issue are Mark Bata of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Paul Rothman of the California Institute of Technology. They were tremendous in developing this issue, and they worked very hard for this, and I really uh, must thank them uh, for their efforts in putting this issue together. It was a true pleasure working with them. And now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Mark Bata as the moderator for the webinar today. So Mark is an associate professor in, in biological engineering at MIT, uh, and he's also associated with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, uh, and is a member of the MIT Center for Excitonics, the MIT Center for Neurobiological Engineering, and the MIT Center for Environmental Health Sciences. So Mark obtained his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees at MIT, um, really working in various departments, including mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, chemistry, and biological engineering. Very interdisciplinary. 
he carried out postdoctoral research in biological physics at the University of Munich and then returned to, to, returned to MIT in 2009 as a faculty member. His current research focuses on developing integrated computational experimental approaches for engineering biology. Uh, applications explored in his lab include membrane biology and biophysics, including in situ characterization of neuronal synapse proteomic composition, amyloid aggregation, bacterial cell wall synthesis, and bacterial toxin transport. Um, they've also developed a number of tools, including quantitative fluorescence imaging and spectroscopy, along with synthetic nucleic acid architectures that act as nanometer scale 3D scaffolds for dyes, proteins, RNA, and plasmonic nanoparticles. So Mark, thank you indeed for moderating the webinar today, and of course for guest editing this MRS bulletin issue, and I will hand this over to you. Thank you very much, Gopal, and uh, thank you to MRS for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, put together this very exciting issue, and, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. It's uh, my pleasure to host today's webinar on DNA nanotechnology, um, and I'm hosting today on behalf of both myself as well as Paul Rubeman, who was unable to join us uh, from Caltech. Um, so the issue, as Gopal uh, explained, introduces DNA nanotechnology by featuring uh, 11 articles uh, by over 20 authors who are international leaders in the field of DNA nanotechnology uh, from over a dozen different institutions worldwide. The goal of the issue was to introduce DNA nanotechnology to material scientists working in a broad variety of sub-disciplines of material science, offering them a diversity of practical approaches to applying both structured as well as dynamical DNA assemblies and motifs in their own work and research applications. Uh, slide advance, please. So DNA nanotechnology has seen tremendous growth over the past decades due to a, a number of foundational studies that have demonstrated how to program increasingly complex large-scale structured DNA assemblies, as shown here in this figure, as well as dynamical assemblies. Just a brief sort of history showing the evolution of the field shows that in 1991, when Ned Seaman really pioneered uh, this strategy for programming nanoscale materials, he demonstrated in the course of a year or so how to self-assemble a programmed 10 nanometer scale cube uh, from 10 constituent DNA strands. Uh, this small-scale demonstration of how to program complex architectures from the bottom up was followed by work from Paul Rotherman in 2006, who together with William Shi introduced the use of a long scaffold strand of DNA consisting of around 7,000 bases from a virus called M13 phage to program much larger scale uh, DNA origami assemblies using over 200 synthetic helper strands uh, that reached yet another length scale of uh, 50 to 100 nanometers. And most recently, uh, Lulu Chan's lab from Caltech showed us how to self-assemble uh, 64 of these distinct DNA origamis into a larger scale, even larger scale pattern on the micron scale, um, shown at right, uh, using these origamis to self-assemble in specific ways uh, to form uh, complex architectures um, shown here in, in this Mona Lisa rendition. Uh, next slide, please. So today, as Gopal mentioned, DNA nanotechnology has impacted through pioneering works a broad diversity of application areas shown here as the leaves of this tree from our introductory article to this issue, ranging from areas such as plasmonics and nanophotonics to nanometrology and single molecule chemistry, as well as designer 3D crystals, self-organizing patterns, and also active gels. The goal of this issue and, and webinar is to show in a practical way to material scientists how 
these different application areas that have been demonstrated in pioneering works might be leveraged by individual material scientists worldwide to impact their own subdiscipline and, and sub area of interest within material science, ranging from electronic materials to energy storage to thin films, magnetic materials, and nanoparticles in rheology, as shown uh, as the roots of, of this tree. Next slide, please. And so towards this end, we're very fortunate to have three of our lead co-authors from this issue present three distinct webinars of approximately 15 minutes each to cover the different areas of the uh, articles that are uh, featured in this issue. So first, we'll have Carlos Castro from The Ohio State University, who will cover basic practical aspects of designing computationally as well as synthesizing and characterizing programmed DNA assemblies from the bottom up. He'll then talk about application of these assemblies to measuring forces and free energies of individual proteins and molecules at the single molecule level with high precision, as well as programming nanoscale organizations of multiple enzymes as well as optical components for functional applications. Uh, next slide, please. In the second talk, Tom Labine from North Carolina State University will present applications of structured and dynamical DNA assemblies to program both 3D crystalline as well as active materials, as well as touch on the use of RNA for programming uh, such assemblies. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, Will Hughes from Boise State University will present application of DNA nanotechnology to both patterning in 2D using lithography as well as to nanometrology. Okay, with that, I'd just like to thank, again, the audience for joining us today and, and the MRS for uh, organizing this special issue on DNA nanotechnology. And we will now dive into our first talk by Professor Carlos Castro. Great. Well, first, uh, before getting started, I'd like to thank uh, MRS for this opportunity to share some of this work uh, with this new community of material science, and we're optimistic that this can lead uh, to some new exciting collaborations. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark and Paul for the opportunity to be part of the, the bulletin and part of the webinar today. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be mainly presenting on a, a couple of the articles, this practical aspects of structural and dynamic DNA nanotechnology um, and also the article focused on uh, using DNA nanostructures for biophysical measurements, um, but I will touch at a high level on a couple other articles. And I wanted mainly to start with this uh, depiction of DNA nanotechnology from this material science point of view with this structure properties processing performance tetrahedron. Um, in, in many ways, we can think about DNA a, a, as a material much like any other material one of the unique aspects really comes into this in this nucleotide sequence where we have a lot of ability based on this nucle nucleotide sequence, we have a strong ability to program what the nanoscale structure um, or the nanoscale geometry looks like. And in turn, that allows us to, to have uh, some impressive control over the performance of these nanostructures or devices. Um, so before uh, we get into things, uh, again, kind of thinking about why would we like to use DNA to build things out of, you are likely more familiar with the biological function of DNA, which is really to store information, where that information is encoded in the sequence of nucleotides or the sequence of bases. Um, and it turns out some of these same properties that make DNA a good material for storing information also make it a good material for this program self-assembly. And primarily, the main, uh, the main property is one that I alluded to is this uh, nucleotide sequence and, and the fact that the rules that govern DNA self-assembly are relatively simple. Um, you may even remember, if you haven't thought about biology in a while, that DNA consists of four different nucleotides or four different bases, right? And they bind together in a very specific way in that a G base binds to a C base and an A base binds to a, a T base. And to a first order, that's really all you need to know to understand how these uh, DNA sequences will self-assemble into a double helix. It has some other favorable, pro favorable properties in that it's well-defined um, and, you know, that we can actually tune the mechanical properties, uh, which I'll come back to uh, in a little bit. Um, so uh, the idea of leveraging this uh, nucleotide sequence design to build structures was first pioneered by Ned Seaman in the early 80s, where the original idea 
was to build these junctions, is to use sequence design to build these static junctions, and then basically taking these junctions, which are a, a few different arms that connect at a single point, and then building those into lattices by using what are referred to as sticky end overhangs, where you would have a few single-stranded bases, for example, on the right side, that could bind to some single-stranded bases on a neighboring structure. And then if you sort of make this a, a lattice of repetitive units, right, you could build up these two-dimensional or three-dimensional lattices, with the original idea being to build uh, crystals, right, uh, to use DNA crystals to template uh, proteins or other biomolecules for crystallography. Um, and Ned's lab really drove the field uh, for a long time, right, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, these are some of the, uh, the structures that, that his lab first built. Um, and about eight years ago, his lab also realized this ability to program a crystal. Uh, and this continues to be an ongoing area of research, um, as uh, indicated uh, by the article uh, by Ned and Ned Seaman and Ola Gang in the bulletin uh, that Tom Levine will talk a little bit about later. Um, so this is uh, a nice, the, uh, the first figure from this practical aspects of structural and dynamic DNA nanotechnology that discusses uh, some of the main assembly methods uh, in the top row here. Um, this assembly approach is similar to what Ned originally developed, where you have these branched junctions. Um, in many cases, these branches or these arms may actually consist of more than a single DNA duplex um, just to make those arms stiffer. All right, but the idea is still we can build these junctions and use sticky ends or, or single-stranded DNA connections to build those junctions into larger lattices or even into polyhedra um, or those kinds of structures. Two of the other main approaches for building DNA nanostructures are what are called a single-stranded DNA tile. And these structures, um, these are built uh, generally from short strands, um, and these short strands are programmed to bind to each other in a specific way. Um, but in the end, each of these strands you can consider as a little tile in this molecular canvas, and by selectively including or excluding strands, you can build all kinds of different shapes, as, for example, is shown by this heart here. Um, and uh, th this was developed by Peng Yin's group, um, and that was later extended to three-dimensional structures, um, as you see over here in these TM, TM images on the right. Um, another very popular approach that was developed by Paul Rodemond, um, one of the editors of the bulletin, was the scaffolded DNA origami approach, where now we use a long template strand that's maybe seven or 8,000 bases long and can use design sequences of shorter strands to program the folding of that long strand in some more compact structures. Um, this smiley face was one of the structures that Paul first presented in his landmark paper. Um, and more recently, in much more complicated structures. I'll, I'll show other examples later, um, but a couple examples of wireframe origami. These were actually focused on um, some automated design papers. Nice work that came out recently over the last couple of years uh, from Bjorn Hogberg's lab and from Mark Batten's lab. Uh, so these are just a couple of quick videos that illustrate this single-stranded DNA tile approach and the scaffolded DNA, DNA origami approach. I'll start with the tile approach on the left. In the tile approach, as I mentioned, you're designing structures exclusively from short strands. Um, these short strands are broken up into modules or domains, in this case, four domains. Um, each of those domains binds to a different neighbor, right? And you can sort of see how this, this uh, block-type motif uh, forms one of those tiles in that molecular canvas, basically by binding to four different neighbors. Uh, this video will continue to play, uh, but hopefully you get the idea um, that basically we can scale this out to a full sheet. Um, and again, by selectively including or excluding these tiles, we can build custom shapes. Um, in the scaffolded DNA origami approach shown on the right, this video is uh, courtesy of Sean Douglas from UCSF. Uh, this is just an animation showing here you have the long template strand. Um, and the several shorter strands that bind uh, in a piecewise manner to this template or scaffold strand. And then the piecewise binding to that scaffold strand sort of pinches that scaffold into uh, to, to fold up into some compact structure, um, in this example, into some kind of compact rectangle. Um, and this, this is just a quick overview of the fabrication process or the workflow of the fabrication process, specifically for the scaffolded DNA origami approach. The other approaches would be maybe conceptually similar with different details. Uh, I won't spend much time on this. The details of this are presented in this paper reference down here from several years ago. Um, but the basic idea is, as shown for this example of a, this robot-like structure, is we have the scaffold strand that's typically derived from an M13 uh, bacteriophage viral genome. So that's biologically derived. 
um, that can be grown up in the lab or purchased from any one of a number of companies. The staples, we a lot of the design process goes into actually designing the sequences of those staples um, that, that ultimately will drive folding of that scaffold into some custom shape. Um, those are, uh, again, ordered, uh, chemically synthesized and ordered from a commercial vendor. Um, typically, those would be organized by some subsets of the structure. Um, we can pool those or pipette those uh, DNA strands that make up a, a given part of the structure into modules. Those are we would refer to as pre-stocks. Um, and then we would basically now uh, combine all the modules that we'd like to make up a given structure, mix that with the scaffold, and subject that to some thermal annealing self-assembly process, um, of course, taking care to, to uh, put this into the right solution conditions. Um, and ultimately, one of the very common ways to uh, analyze the structures is by transmission electron microscopy, as shown here for this robot structure. Um, this slide really just shows uh, sort of the geometric design space or the huge range of complex geometries that you can make um, with these DNA uh, nanostructure assembly approaches. Um, on the left here, you see all of these kind of different kinds of solid structures, wireframes, or, or these things that are structurally as complex as gears, um, these polyhedra or stacked grid type structures. This is that single-stranded tile approach um, where you can really uh, make a huge range of two-dimensional or three-dimensional structures just by including different subsets of these uh, molecular 2D or 3D molecular canvases, um, some kind of enclosed uh, capsules. Um, and, and then another uh, growing area recently in the field is, is to build larger structures. Um, this was a nice paper from Tom Levine's group from a few years ago demonstrating that you could build larger structures by using uh, larger template strengths. So one of the uh, growing areas of the field is also in de development of these software tools that aid the design process. Um, they're highlighted here on the left. I won't go through all of these. Um, I just picked a few of the more of the more popular recently developed ones. CAD Nano, I would say, is really um, the main uh, software tool, especially for this scaffolded DNA origami approach. This was developed um, by William Shee's lab. Um, William Shee's lab was uh, one of the pioneers of developing three-dimensional scaffolded DNA origami structures. Um, so I'd say this this is probably the main design tool in the scaffolded DNA origami uh, approach. Can do is actually a finite element. Uh, based software that, that does uh, structure prediction or, or prediction of a, a folded shape uh, based on these CAD Nano designs or more recently some other types of designs. Um, and a, a recent emphasis in the field has been in automating the design process. This data list is a nice approach, a, a nice example from Mark Botz's lab that came out about a year ago in automating actually even the scaffold routing and the staple design process um, for these uh, solid structures where you just start with a, a model of the solid structure and the rest of the design process is automated. Um, uh, in terms of building the dynamic or mechanical functionality of the structures, uh, another uh, advantage of the D these DNA nanostructures is that there's a huge range of mechanical properties to work with. Um, these videos just show the thermal fluctuations of double-stranded DNA on the left, this is a, a six helix bundle um, where we have six, bundle, six helices bundled together into this type of cross section and the 56 helix bundle. And the main point being that um, you can see that the bending stiffness varies over uh, orders of magnitude. Um, and actually uh, here I'm showing this in terms of persistence length where we can access everything from single stranded DNA, which is extremely flexible even over a short length scale all the way up to something that's essentially rigid or about as stiff as an actin filament, if, if uh, you're familiar with structural biopolymers. Um, so we have this huge range of mechanical properties or several orders of magnitude of stiffness to work with. Um, and that really allows us to build dynamic systems. Um, this is a slide illustrating some of the, the different classes of dynamic structures. Um, we either have these kind of strand-based systems that can be uh, reconfigured or that can actually sort of translate along a track. Um, as you might imagine, uh, triggered containers, it, this would be for sort of drug delivery type applications. Um, structures that undergo other kinds of well-defined mechanical motion, more, um, you know, hinges that open and closed or rotors that can, can, that can swivel around a point. Um, our lab has been pretty active in developing these kind of machine-like structures that can undergo uh, well-defined motions where you might have several joints integrated, for example, in this crank slider or this linkage that, that translates between a closed bundle or open frame uh, configuration. Um, 
In terms of building towards uh, robotic systems or responsive materials, um, th these dynamic uh, structures can be coupled with these nanostructure response elements. Um, for example, pH sensitive reconfiguration um, or ion or temperature sensitive reconfiguration of these base stacking interactions. Uh, DNA aptamers have also been integrated. Aptamers are DNA motifs that bind to specific target molecules um, that are uh, non-DNA molecules. Um, or light sensitive um, molecules can be integrated into duplexes to make light, light responsive systems. By far the most commonly used approach is this DNA strand displacement um, where you can selectively and in, se in a se sequence specific manner sort of take apart duplexes um, leading to reconfiguration of the structure. Um, that DNA strand displacement has been integrated um, and, and for example in these molecular walker systems, this is a, another figure from that paper highlighting uh, from the uh, practical aspects of structural and dynamic, dynamic DNA nanotechnology paper um, highlighting some of these dynamic systems where either in, in a walker system um, where walkers can be designed to navigate actually a complex network of tracks uh, or, or in some sense uh, make decisions as they walk along a track um, using uh, uh, DNA, uh, DNA medi mediated dynamic control. Um, and in this case, this is using a template um, where we have these uh, reconfigurable strands that are kind of arrayed along a static template um, to, to demonstrate here that this group demonstrated uh, a computing framework um, where the, the computing steps occur much faster um, because all of these strands are localized on a static DNA or a GAMI template as opposed to floating around in solution. Um, so that's a, a quick overview of the practical um, aspects of structural and dynamic DNA nanotechnology. Um, I'll now highlight uh, some of the aspects of this precision measurements article um, where the main theme of this paper is, is this ability to leverage uh, the, the geometric and dynamic properties that I've kind of highlighted so far, um, but com combine that with site-specific functionalization of these DNA structures to ultimately make uh, devices that can measure molecular scale structure, dynamics, and interactions. And one of the true powers of this approach is to be able to do that in the context of user-defined molecular positioning and orientation. Um, so uh, I won't go into the details of this, but just wanted to highlight uh, uh, Kurt Gotthelf has an article focusing on chemical modifications and, and site-specifically functionalizing DNA with a wide array of molecules. Um, and that really is a key uh, capability in, that goes into designing these molecular instrumentation uh, devices for precision measurements. Um, so um, really a lot of the measurement applications leverage the ability to control geometry combined with this ability for site-specific functionalization. Um, this figure shows several examples including, for example, um, templating motor proteins and defined arrays or spacings to look at cooperativity of motor proteins or these couple papers uh, from Bjorn Hogberg's lab uh, and Tom Levine's group demonstrating templating of ligands or clustering of ligands to look at how cells respond to, to ligands in different patterns or spacings. Um, other things like uh, uh, templating fluorophores or gold nanoparticles um, or making nanopores or uh, confined environments to study um, how molecules behave in these uh, constricted environments. Another large uh, subset of these measurement devices is moving towards leveraging the dynamic or mechanical properties uh, for example, to make devices that can bind or, or detect target molecules in solution or these kinds of caliper devices that can study. In, in these two cases, both are looking at nu nucleosomes. In this case, work from Hendrik Dietz's group looking at stacking forces between nucleosomes um, or work from our lab uh, looking at unwrapping or, uh, or the, the mechanics of, of wrapping and the structure and stability of nucleosomes. Um, and a couple other examples looking at uh, forces and molecular interactions or crowding or actually looking at the effects of forces on uh, binding between DNA and DNA binding proteins. Um, and I'd say another recent area in this measurements direction is actually leveraging DNA nanostructures to enhance other measurement systems. Um, that's highlighted in this top row here. Um, for example, to make a static frame that, that aids in the electron microscopy um, reconstruction uh, measurement or approach. Um, in this case, the DNA origami frame provides a nice high contrast um, particle that helps in determining the orientation or actually controlling the orientation of the structure um, or other examples of, of using DNA origami to orient 
uh, DNA strands to look at recombination or as uh, calibration standards for super resolution microscopy or using leveraging or uh, exploiting the stiffness of these DNA origami structures to improve the force resolution and force spectroscopy. Um, another area of in increasing emphasis in the field is really integrating with other materials or fabrication systems. Um, in this case, on the left here, we have a DNA origami templating carbon nanotubes. Um, or also controlling the shape of liposomes or vesicles. Um, our, our group, our, our lab recently developed the uh, methods to embed DNA nanostructures or DNA origami structures onto cell surfaces. And this paper was a nice rest demonstration recently from Paul, Paul Rudiman's group, uh, demonstrating the, the incorporation, the site-specific incorporation of these DNA structures onto microfabricated systems. Um, some of these properties, the same properties that make these uh, capable to design these custom measurement devices um, can also be leveraged for control applications, right? And, and uh, an exciting area in the field of DNA nanotechnology is leveraging these devices or, or DNA nanostructures to control enzymatic reactions. Um, so these are just a few examples. This was an article, uh, another article in, in the paper highlight in the, art in the bulletin issue highlighting some of this work. Um, where we have the ability to control enzymes or template enzymes or um, control these uh, DNA aptamer binding motifs to, to test binding to uh, proteins. Um, and similarly, we can, rather than integrating enzymes or proteins, you could imagine um, there's been a lot of work in integrating and, and controlling nanoparticles, um, for example, to make these chiral structures of gold nanoparticles or to embed these nano rods where we can control the chirality by reconfiguring the DNA template, um, or looking at binding of fluorophores in these hot spots between nanoparticles in, in these cases. Um, and so I'll stop there. Um, that was just a quick overview of these two articles with a couple highlights of, of, of other um, articles, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. All right. Uh... Thanks very much again to Carlos Castro for putting together a fantastic uh, webinar um, on this uh, first of our three-part series. Uh, with this, we're going to turn to now the question and answer period. And so we welcome all questions from the audience. You can type into your enter your question bar on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll lead off with the first question, which is um, for uh, Dr. Castro, what is a typical yield and scale of fabrication of DNA nanostructures. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. That's uh, that's a uh, important question. Um, so the yield, uh, typically, in terms of the scaffolded DNA origami approach, um, we would think of it in terms of you know what what fraction of scaffold folds into the target structure, um, and that can vary greatly for relatively simple structures. Um, in particular, for two-dimensional structures, something like these flat rectangles. The yields can be upwards of 90%, you know, close to 100%. Um, for more complex structures, that can be as low as you know, 5 to 10% for some of these complicated dynamic structures uh, I showed in the talk. You know, sometimes the yields can be as low as 5%. Um, that's not a, a huge issue uh, because there are purification methods. Um, oftentimes, you can isolate the target structure that you're interested in, even if the yields are relatively low using things like gel electrophoresis um, centrifugation or, or even something maybe in the future like a sucrose gradient. Um, in, in terms of the, the scales, uh, from a dimension standpoint, typical scales of individual structures are, you know, maybe 10 to 100 nanometers. Um, as, as Mark showed an example in the, in the first session or, or in one of the early slides, uh, there's been some nice recent work building that out to micron scale structures. Um, and the fabrication scales of a typical reaction, self-assembly reaction, would be on the microgram scale, maybe 1 to 10 or even up to 100 micrograms. Um, that can be scaled. Um, th that's not a huge problem to scale the fabrication up to even you know, hundreds of micrograms or milligram scale, which is a, a, an important part of enabling applications. Um, there was also a nice paper recently uh, from Hendrik Dietz's group that just came out a few days ago on doing biological, uh, biotechnological production of DNA uh, DNA origami structures, which, you know, once you come up with a, a, a design for an application, that could be a nice way to scale even to larger, you know, many milligram quantities that would be needed for applications. All right. Thanks, uh, Carlos. Um, uh, second question, um, 
is uh, how stable are program DNA assemblies or DNA nanostructures in diverse environments, including biological environments. So these are, are typically fabricated um, in uh, pretty relatively high ionic conditions, at least to say something like a biological environment. Um, typical ranges, say for divalent uh, cations, would be you know, 10 to 20 or 30 uh, millimolar um, uh, of divalent cation concentration. The most typical one is magnesium chloride. Um, you can also uh, have these things in sodium chloride monovalent ions that there the ranges would, would, of, of fabrication would be maybe in the 500 to 1,000 millimolar, you know, the molar range. Um, once they're folded, they, are, they can be stable down to lower ion concentrations, um, and that, that is structure dependent. Um, some of these wireframe structures, because they're not so tightly packed, can be stable down to uh, lower ion concentrations, even, even in the range of uh, physiological ion concentrations, maybe the, the one millimolar magnesium chloride and a few hundred millimolar, millimolar sodium chloride. Um, typical things like melting temperatures would be typically maybe 60 degrees C. Um, you know, pH ranges are, you know, things you'd expect and, you know, plus minus a few uh, from, from uh, seven or eight. So, you know, down to, to four or five, I think it's, it's okay. And maybe up to nine or 10 uh, on, on, the, uh, on the higher end would be okay. Um, let's see. In terms of the other thing to think about in biological environments is enzymatic degradation that can occur. Um, and, and they are definitely subject to enzymatic degradation, but it happens on a much slower time scale than just free double-stranded DNA. Um, so where free double-stranded DNA might degrade in minutes, these structures can last up to, up to several hours even. Um, and there has been some nice work uh, recently from, uh, for example, William Shee's lab in functionalizing uh, and from Torsten Schmidt's lab uh, in functionalizing with PEG or with uh, coating it in, in, with uh, lipid membrane or uh, other molecules to enhance the stability in biological environments. Great, thanks. Uh, so we'll take one final question uh, before we move on to the next talk. Um, so what are some of the future needs for modeling tools? Um, sure, so that, that's, a, that, that's a growing and important area of the field to really enable improved design uh, for functionality. Um, there's been a lot of early success in developing models to predict structure. Um, so that, you, you know, and that, that's a really important part of the design process um, is to be able to validate, um, you know, ahead of uh, actually ordering DNA and, and doing the fabrication process. Um, and, and more recently, as I alluded to during the talk, there's been some emphasis on automating the design process. Um, so you can, now the hope is that we can sort of integrate um, the design process with the modeling process. Um, but another important step that I think is coming um, is actually developing models that can predict the function of these devices, so not just structure, um, but actually predict dynamic function, stiffness, um, you know, different kinds of actuation responses, how they might interact with functionalized molecules. Um, so rather than just designing for structure or even maybe dynamic behavior, you can really develop physics-based models to predict function um, that you could uh, ultimately then integrate uh, ideally into some kind of automated design process. All right. Uh, thanks again very, very much, Carlos, for an excellent uh, presentation and also for hosting the Q&A.